In this video, we're going to cover section 2.5, where we will gather a little bit more information about the periodic table before we finish chapter two by figuring out types of compounds, be it molecular or ionic, and lastly, how to name them. But we need to figure out how to pull some information from the periodic table before we have that ability. So let's get into that. What is the periodic table? Where did it come from? There were actually two individuals who independently came up with a periodic table of the elements, kind of recognized the properties that were shared and how to sort these things. Dmitry Mendeleev, he was a Russian who did it in 1869, and then Lothar Meyer in Germany in 1870, right? Year apart, but information wasn't freely shared, so they both independently came up with it. Mendeleev tends to get a lot of the credit here, because not only did he do it a year sooner, that's less significant, but he actually used his periodic table to predict the existence of other elements before they were discovered, which is pretty neat. So to take some things for example, right? If you look at group one, the first column in the periodic table, you've got lithium, sodium, and potassium. They, these guys figured out they're all shiny. They conduct heat and electricity. Similar reactivities. So they go in the same column. And you'll see that's what's actually important in the periodic table, the columns, more than the rows. At group two, we see the same thing, cal calcium, strontium, and barium. So those go in a separate group. And that's a key idea, right? Things that are in the same group react similarly to one another, aka they're in the same column. Those numbers that go across the top, those are called group numbers on the periodic table. So I mentioned this information already, right? Mendeleev used his table to predict other elements, right? Gallium and germanium, they're on the bottom. This is what Mendeleev looks like, heck of a beard, and that is what his original periodic table looks like over there on the right-hand side. A little bit different than the modern one that we have today. And they originally thought that this trend in the periodic table was due to the atomic mass, okay? But it's actually due to the atomic number, right? Reactivity is controlled by the number of protons. That controls the chemical identity, as we've alluded to in previous videos. Okay. So we've kind of evolved to having this modern periodic table. Right? And now we'll talk about what information this can give to us. Okay. And we get a new law. I'm putting into actual words what I just said on the previous slide, right, periodic law, properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. So make sure you have that in your list of laws that you've learned from chapter one and chapter two. And that's the reason that the modern periodic table, if you read it like a book, right, left to right, top down, the elements are arranged by increasing atomic number. Okay? But as I've already mentioned, it's the vertical columns that group things together with similar properties. Okay, those are called groups. The other things, the rows, are called periods or series. And okay, so looking on this slide here, you see groups are numbered at the top, 1 through 18. And then the periods are numbered over here on the left, 1 through 7. So if you were to pick a random group, let's say we did you know, 14 here, carbon, silicon, germanium react more similarly to one another than do carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then this information down in the bottom left here, we've already seen why that's useful, right? To predict the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay. So what other information does the periodic table give us? Well, we can loosely group things into three kind of classifications of elements because they have big differences in properties. On the left-hand side and the bottom of the periodic table, we have metals, which are characterized by being shiny, right? malleable, which means they're soft, you can contort them, good conductors of heat and electricity. Nonmetals are dull, poor conductors of heat and electricity, and they're oftentimes gaseous as well as being solid. And then we have metalloids, which conduct heat and electricity okay, have some properties of metals, some properties of nonmetals, so kind of halfway in between. And notice the colors. Here for metals, nonmetals, and metalloids, those correspond to the colors on this slide here. Okay, so metals in blue, 
on the left and on the bottom, just excluding hydrogen there. Hydrogen, along with everything else that's green, is a nonmetal. And then the metalloids there in the middle. You can think about them as being a staircase starting with boron and going down. But we can actually further break them down than just metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Okay? We have what are called main group elements. Those are groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18. So if I jump back a slide, it's the powers on the side. So 1 and 2 stick up, and then 13 through 18. Those are main group elements. We'll see what's significant about those in Chapter 6. In the middle here, groups 3 through 12, we have transition metals. And in the bottom here, we have what are called inner transition metals. So see transition metals, group 3 through 12. And then the inner transition metals at the bottom. The top row is often called the lanthanides, the bottom row often called the actinides, named after the elements that start that row. We also have names for our individual groups. You have the alkali metals in group one. Again, hydrogen is excluded because it's not a metal. Alkaline earth metals in group two, chalcogens in group 16, halogens in group 17, and the noble gases in group 18. We also have group 15, those are called nictogens, and everything else is kind of nameless. And you should be familiar with them, right? Things that are grouped together, it's for a reason, because they react similarly. So you should know these names. I'll often refer to them in later videos and get those names because they behave similarly. And all that information is summarized nicely here on this slide, slide 81, all those names we just listed. And the last bit of information we've alluded to in a previous video, okay, if you see things that have a bracket around the atomic mass, okay, and it's a whole number, that means that they're entirely radioactive. So the average atomic mass can't be determined because they're always undergoing nuclear decay. So that number that's provided as the mass number on the periodic table is that of the most stable isotope. And everything that's in pink here is a radioactive element. The two blues are liquids, and the greens on this slide are gases. Everything else in white is a solid. So that summarizes the information we can get from the periodic table. You should know everything that I've talked about in this video because you'll use it extensively in Chapter 2. Because from here, we're going to figure out how these things combine together to form molecules and compounds, and then how to name them.